member for Sherwood Park for Saskatchewan. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. It's a pleasure to address the House today and always. Uh, Madam Speaker, yesterday, Common Sense Conservatives announced our demands for the upcoming federal budget. Uh, we call on the government to axe the tax on farmers and food by immediately passing Bill C-234 in its original form. We called on the government to build the homes, not bureaucracy, by requiring cities permit 15% more home building each year as a condition for receiving federal infrastructure money. And we called on the government to cap the spending with a dollar for dollar rule to bring down interest rates and inflation. We said the government must find a dollar in savings for every new dollar of spending. These were the three common sense conservative demands for the budget. Axing the tax on farmers and on food, building homes, not bureaucracies, and instituting a dollar for dollar rule. And of course, conservatives in government would go further to ax the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, and stop the crime. Under this NDP Liberal government, we see how spending is completely out of control. Uh, under this Prime Minister, Canada will spend $46.5 billion this year to service the debt. That's more than the federal health transfer. The government is spending more servicing the debt than the federal health transfer. The Honourable Member, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary is rising on a point of order. Madam Speaker, when the budget comes out, um, the member will be provided a wonderful opportunity to talk about a budget. Uh, it'll be coming up very soon, very, very soon. But today we're actually debating uh, about an individual, yes. Mr. Uh, coming to the park. The Honourable Member knows there's a lot of leeway in how we introduce subjects. I am expecting the Honourable Member for Sherwood Park for Saskatchewan to get to the heart of the, the motion. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I know, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, the, the member opposite is uh, is enthusiastic uh, to to hear the rest of my speech, and I invite him to uh, to hear it now. Um, the Prime Minister uh, is responsible for forty six and a half billion dollars this year in debt servicing costs. That is more than the federal government will transfer in health care. Astronomical amounts of money being given to bankers and bondholders uh, for this Prime Minister's out-of-control debt. This Prime Minister is not worth the cost, the crime, or the corruption. Now today, uh, as the members pointed out, we're not debating the budget directly. We're discussing a question of privilege uh, that relates centrally to government spending, to how this government spends taxpayer dollars uh, and um, and the controls or lack of controls associated with that spending. Um, and the point I want to uh, emphasize is that this scandal, this arrive scam scandal, is intimately linked to overarching uh, questions about how taxpayer dollars are spent. The government spent sixty million dollars and counting as far as we know, as far as the, the da data was available uh, on the Arrive scam app, $60 million. But that is a, a drop in a much larger ocean of contracting out to government insiders. The Arrive scam scandal is illustrative of this larger problem of abuse, corruption, uh, at, at, at best, uh, extremely generous contracting out uh, that leads uh, to, to so much waste of taxpayers' dollars. The, the government will try to convince people that all of their spending is necessarily associated with meeting immediate needs that Canadians face, but that is very clearly not true. So we need to understand this picture of how government procurement is being abused under this NDP Liberal government, how costly that is for taxpayers, and also what an opportunity this presents for us to do better, for us to save money for taxpayers uh, and focus instead on the core needs of our country. So specifically on, on the uh, Arrive, uh, Arrive scam scandal, we had, according to the Auditor General's report, a rigged process. We had a process in which specifications were put in place which don't appear to make any logical sense, uh, which served the result of getting this one company with only two people the ability to access this contract. 
Uh, GC Strategies uh, got the contract for, for the Arrive Scam app. They, they got the contract, they subcontracted it. Uh, their company alone uh, got, uh, according to estimates, some $20 million. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't do any work uh, other than the very sort of perfunctory activity of going on LinkedIn and finding others who might be able to, to, to perform the skills. A, a, a simple way of understanding what GC Strategies did and didn't do, Madam Speaker, is if, if you hired me to paint your fence for $100, you probably wouldn't, but if you did, then I went out and hired the member for Winnipeg North and paid him $50 to paint the fence. And uh, he painted your fence, he got $50, you paid me 100 and I just got $50 for facilitating the deal. Maybe I went on LinkedIn to find that uh, the member for Winnipeg North could paint fences. And he might be looking for job opportunities like this after the next election, so it might be a relevant, uh, relevant example. Um, Madam, Madam, Madam Speaker, in that process, the, the middleman, the person who got the contract and passed it on, didn't actually do anything. They didn't add any value. Uh, and, and yet, uh, they, they were able to collect big time. So, so Madam, Madam Speaker, uh, the, the, the nature of this scandal is that you had this so-called uh, staff augmentation firm, I think is the lingo, GC Strategies, took the contract uh, and then they were able to subcontract it and get a whole bunch of money in, in, the, in the meantime for doing nothing. But the process was that allowed GC Strategies to get this contract was a rigged process. In fact, the Auditor General revealed how GC Strategies sat down with government officials in one case and set the terms uh, of the contract that they would then bid on. So, uh, we, we heard uh, at Public Accounts Committee over the break that uh, KPMG was told to go through GC strategies by government officials. They were said, you should, if you wanna be part of this work, you need to go through GC strategies. So, so the government was aware of other companies that could do this work and yet they directed those companies to go through GC strategies. So there was something clearly of a special relationship whereby uh, members of this NDP Liberal government were keen to see GC strategies cashing in big time for reasons uh, that remain uh, somewhat unclear. GC strategies is also a company, by the way, that, that doctored resumes that they were submitting to the government. Uh, this, is, this is something that, uh, that we should be teaching children that is not uh, appropriate or ethical to be doctoring your resume in order to access an opportunity that you wouldn't otherwise qualify for. And yet GC Strategies, it appears it was doctoring resumes uh, systematically. What they explained to us at committee, Christian Firth, uh, during his, his earlier appearance, he said, well, we changed the resumes to make them compliant with the requirements of the contract. Then we go back to the resource and say, is that okay? Right? So, if, uh, if I'm applying for a government contract uh, and, and I have five months experience and I'm supposed to have five years experience, then uh, GC strategies would change, cross out months and write in years and then send it back to me and say, we made this little change, is that okay? And then they would send it off, send it off to the government afterwards. Christian Firth admitted that this wasn't just something they didn't want, this was, this was their process, adjusting resumes to meet the requirements of the contract then checking in if it was okay before uh, sending this in. What a wild, broken system, Madam Speaker. So, so we have rigging of the process, we have systematic cheating, uh, things that, uh, that, uh, that young children should know are, are highly unethical and that seem to have been happening systematically in the government. Despite these obvious problems with GC strategies, uh, this liberal NDP government was keen to push other companies to work through the GC strategies. And then we have uh, obfuscation at committees accusing people of lying. So these are some of the particular issues around the Arrive Scam scandal. Uh, but, but to think about this in the context of the budget, of the overall fiscal situation. So we've been digging more on, on Arrive Scam to ask what are the procurement practices that allow this sort of thing to happen? What's happening more broadly inside of government that allowed $60 million to be spent in this case. 
and for nobody to seem to, to notice or care. Well, first of all, this process of contracting to people who contract to other people, it, it wasn't just a one-off. It wasn't something that just happened in the case of ArriveKit. We found that there are, get this, Madam Speaker, 635 companies who do IT staff augmentation for the federal government. 635 companies whose job it is to receive contracts and then contract out. So, so I think there are cases where contracting out is likely legitimate. But I'm very skeptical of the fact that there is any value in contracting out to those who subcontract and perhaps further subcontract after that. That the, the general contractor project management function should be able to be performed inside of government. And yet we have 635 companies that do IT staff augmentation only, that act as these middlemen, Madam Speaker, these, these, uh, these, these middle companies who receive contracts and contracts out, 635 of them in the IT space alone. So that's not just a one-off. That's not just the Arrive Scam Act. This is a larger issue with how the government tr treats money overall. The larger issue is systematic growth in contracting out and contracting out to those who just do this quote-unquote staff augmentation piece. We've seen how in the midst of dramatic growth in spending on spending in the pub public service, there has also been dramatic growth in spending for contracting out. The government is spending tens of billions of dollars in contracting out, uh, some of it for uh, management consulting. We've talked about uh, the, the enormous growth in spending on McKinsey. Uh, so, so contracting out for management consulting, contracting out to those who further contract out. So we're, we're spending more inside of government, we're also spending dramatically more outside of government. And you would expect those things to be uh, inversely related, that if we're spending more growing public service, then we should be contracting out less. Or maybe if we're contracting out more, that should correspond to uh, having a smaller public service. But the government is growing the size of the public service and contracting out more at the same time. This NDP Liberal government clearly has a profound lack of respect for taxpayers' dollars. And, and they're going to try to tell you, well, well, conservatives want to fix the budget. Where's the money going to come from? Is this going to mean cuts, Madam Speaker? But, but when you look at how broken our contracting system is, when, when you look at, at 635 companies doing staff augmentation in the IT space, tens of billions of dollars being spent on contracting out, I would say pretty clearly there's a lot of room to, to get the budget under control. We, we, can, we can actually stop giving money to these outside companies that are abusing the taxpayer and providing no value. And we can instead provide tax relief to Canadians who need it. We can instead ax the tax, build homes, cap spending. We can get our budget under control if we fix these grotesque abuses in, in government spending. Now, one key aspect of this scandal we need to ask about is where was the minister? Where was the minister in all this? Because it's right and important that we demand answers from these contractors. But you know, Canadians elect members of parliament from which emerge a, a, a cabinet and, and, uh, and a government, an executive branch, who is supposed to be accountable for the decisions that that government makes, uh, who are supposed to be, be providing oversight and policy direction. Uh, of course, ministers aren't involved in the minutia of, of every decision, uh, but they are responsible for the culture and the policy frameworks that are established. And the, the, the best we've heard from ministers on this, I, I asked the Minister of, of Procurement uh, about kind of what he, what he was doing in the midst of this Arrive Scam scandal. Actually, there have, been, there have been a number of different ministers. I think it's been four ministers just in the period since the pandemic that have been responsible for procurement. So, so there, are, there have been many hands that, that should have 
had an opportunity to impact this process. And yet, all of those ministers, and anybody who speaks from the government would have you believe that, well, we're, we, we were just here. I don't, I don't know. It's some, something, something happened in the building that we're supposed to be in charge of, and, uh, and uh, we have no accountability or responsibility for it. And I would say that that is absurd, that ministers should take responsibility for what happens in their department. Uh, they should establish clear expectations in terms of accountability, ethics, respect for, for taxpayers' dollars. And when costly criminal corruption is occurring under the watch of a particular minister, then the minister should have some uh, responsibility should have some response to what she or he was doing uh, in order to, to address those concerning events. The minister, the current minister for public safety, when he was, pardon me, for, for public services and procurement, when he was before a committee, I asked when was he briefed and what did he do? And he said he received a briefing and he provided no directive in terms of action in response to this scandal. Uh, unbelievable. The, the descriptions by public servants are that ministers receive briefs, remain apprised or seized of what's going on, but then ostensibly do nothing, have no role in actually shaping policy outcomes. And that's, and that's just unacceptable. Uh, at, at best, this government uh, has been a, a disinterested passenger uh, in the midst of, of declining respect for taxpayers' dollars. But I think that's actually an overly charitable uh, uh, description. I think this government uh, has it itself has shown flagrant disregard for taxpayers' dollars and has been complicit in various corruption scandals over the eight long years that they've been in power. But even, even in their defense, this government says, well, the minister had nothing to do with it. You know, we, we have someone in this government whose title is the Minister for Public Services and Procurement. And yet when there's one of the biggest procurement scandals in this country's history, the government, the government says, well, well uh, you, you can't expect the Minister of Procurement to have anything to do with a scandal in procurement, right? Like, like it's, it's just in the name, right, uh, uh, Madam Speaker. I, I had proposed at committee, and it elicited uh, points of order, maybe it will today, but I had proposed at committee that we could replace the Minister of Public Services and Procurement with a potted plant, and we would have the same result. A potted plant could receive briefings, naturally. A potted plant could be apprised of events, though would obviously not take any action in response to those events. Um, we, have, we have ministers who were in the room who received briefings but did nothing. They would want us to believe that, that their role as, as a minister in procurement is, is to simply be there, to hear things, to be interested in those things, to receive updates. Again, Madam Speaker, we could save um, a drop in the bucket in, in comparison to other money that could be saved, but we could at least save a minister's salary if, if we replace the current procurement minister indeed with some uh, such inanimate object. Madam Speaker, uh, my, my time being short, I want to underline that the arrive scam scandal as bad as it is in and of itself, is a drop in this larger ocean of government waste and corruption. Uh, there are tens of billions of dollars being spent on, on, on contracting it. Uh, there, is, there is clearly a, a kind of a basic incontinence in, associated with government spending. The money, the money just, just flows out for no discernible reason. And the processes uh, are, are rigged, there's, there's obfuscation, unresponsiveness at committee. And the latest is uh, that we, we've seen how uh, the Indigenous procurement rules are being abused by insiders. Insiders who feel they have no obligation uh, to bring about any benefit to Indigenous communities through their access to Indigenous procurement set aside. And I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done to understand what are the abuses of the Indigenous uh, procurement process that have been happening under, uh, under this government. Uh, very troubling uh, uh, information that's come out. Uh, for instance, uh, D David Yao saying, well, the point of this program isn't to benefit Indigenous communities, it's just to benefit me as, as an entrepreneur. 
Well, I don't, I don't think that's the point of the policy, Madam Speaker. So we see cost, we see corruption, we see crime happening under this government. Uh, and this privilege motion is one key piece of getting to the bottom of what happened, demanding answers from Christian Firth that he was unwilling to give at committee. And this will help us uh, uh, suss out in, in detail all the, the crime, the corruption, and the cost that we are seeing under this NDP Liberal government. Enough is enough. Uh, Canadians are looking for an alternative that will respect taxpayers' dollars, that will restore uh, probity in spending, that will bring it home. Thank yeah. you. Questions and comments? The Honourable